Welcome to the Zanbergen Report, where wealth strategies and investment wisdom collide, featuring your distinguished host and certified financial planner, Bart Zanbergen. Welcome to the Zanbergen Report, a showcase for wealth strategies and investment wisdom that's essential for our evolving world. I'm your host, Bart Zanbergen. Paul, we are in for a special treat today. Special <laughs> treat today. Okay, what, what have we got? Uh, have we got cookies? Have we got wine? <laughs> have we got what have we got here today? All of the above. <laughs> yeah, let, let's hope it's all of the above. So I have the privilege and the honor of bringing a long time friend. We won't say how long, Lorraine, because it's been a few years. <laughs> few years. Yeah. Um, Lorraine Bafuco, lead consultant and CEO of Vantaggio HR. Lorraine, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's and she's so a great guest. Be she's here. been on the show before. And not on your show, but she's been on the station before. Yeah, so you put the headphones on me and give me a mic, and it's hard to get me to be quiet. I love it here. <laughs> well, I'm happy that you met Paul before, and you still decided to come back. <laughs> oh, 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 We're going to need some wine. <laughs> <laughs> so, Lorraine, I know that your company, Vantaggio HR, is basically an outsource human resource company. Exactly. We have a lot of, I know, business owners that listen to our show. So... Tell people what an outsourced human resource company does. Okay, a couple of different things. So there are companies that will be of a size, maybe under 200 or even under 100 employees. And depending upon their needs, it could potentially not make sense for them to have a full-time HR person on staff. But we live in crazy California. Um, The employment laws in California and nationwide are tough to comply with. And the minute you have a small handful of employees, you start having a lot of things that you've got to be careful about with managing staff. So our company provides sort of a fractional HR services to organizations that are of that smaller size. Now, larger companies will still rely on us for special projects occasionally, like training or writing multi-state employee handbooks. Mm -hmm. But the outsourcing portion of our job is we are there on a regular basis being that part-time fractional HR director or manager for the company. Great. And I know you do a great job because you've done so for many of my clients over the years. Yes, and thank you for those referrals oh, and the trust in us. Of course. Um, one thing that I've noticed over the years with you is because you are like superwoman of <laughs> of HR is that um, you are almost like attorney staff. I mean, I can't, we can't say that, but your I am knowledge. Not an attorney, I do not provide legal <laughs> advice. There's my disclaimer. Your knowledge level, I think, is that of many HR attorneys. And I know we, you have a handful that you like to rely on, but. Where would someone, kind of where is that line where someone says, I need to hire Lorraine's company and or I need to bring in an attorney? We usually can take a matter from the routine HR issues that come up at companies all the way up through a situation that might be very contentious and complex. If it starts looking to us and to the business owner manager that uh, a lawsuit is imminent, uh, that's when we really need counsel involved. A lot of times we can help a client company handle a matter up to the point, even through a complicated termination that might be a little bit dicey, but if it's really looking like a lawsuit is imminent or if one has been filed or a formal complaint has been um, registered with, say, the EEOC or the Department of Fair Employment Housing, those are typically earmarks of things that would cause us to want to get counsel involved. Yeah. And I know that over the years you've mentioned if if someone uses you properly and follows your guidelines, that there is a better chance enough that they will not need an attorney. Well, I, I, if I had five cents for every time a client called me up and said, hey, so if we do X, Y, or Z, you can guarantee me that I can't get sued, right? <laughs> so, but no, we really are proud of our knowledge of both state and federal law, not only here in California, but many, many of our clients are multi-state operations. And that added to, I think, my staff and I have a certain level of business savvy that we bring to the table as well. And pretty typically, if clients will take our advice and follow the best practices that we recommend, we can steer them clear of ending up with contentious yeah. and litigious situations. And I know you're not one to tout your own horn, but where are your offices currently? Because I know you're scattered throughout the state. We are. We are headquartered here in Orange County in San Juan Capistrano. We have offices in Sacramento, San Diego, Maui, Honolulu, and New York. You pretty much covered the we, point to point. We <laughs> have all the time zones so that my phone can never be off. That's really yeah. what we've done. So. And I know that there are so many services that you do. One, you know, being an employee handbook, I know it's probably not the most glamorous, but that is um, 
something that most every company has needed. Um, You mentioned earlier hiring and firing. That's got to be the firing part must be so much fun. Um, But you and I have been talking over the last uh, couple of weeks and and kind of three areas that I thought we would touch upon because they were of – the, and I'll let you kind of explain, but there's new tax laws and or new laws, HR laws, um, and it applies to um, sexual harassment training. Mm-hmm. It applies to um, any marijuana use or just medical marijuana use. It, any marijuana use, okay. marijuana as it impacts the workplace. It's a big issue for us yeah. right now in HR. And then um, and this is. I don't know which one of these is going to be the most interesting or most important, but 1099 status. Yeah, I know it's a big thing. Yeah. And given our time, um, let's try to cover three. And I'm, I'm sure I'm going to have to have you back. And we could probably spend a full hour on each one of those subjects. We, we could spend three hours on each one. Because <laughs> you've done it. <laughs> I've done it. Yeah, I do it routinely. So. Um, but maybe like, like a little nugget and then maybe a, an example of each one if you can. If it's Absolutely. Not yeah. So Bart, you mentioned sexual harassment and that what's really kind of at the forefront of people's minds right now is that the law just got changed regarding the training requirements for companies. For many years in California, we've had a law that required training for companies that had 50 or more employees and employers were required when they were doing their head count to count part-time, full-time, even mm. employers, employees, excuse me, out of the state of California. And there was a responsibility for those employers to train their supervisors. And the law had some language in it about what constitutes supervisor, and it's it's pretty broad. The bar is fairly low at what they would consider supervisor. So ostensibly you could be a firm with 45 people outside of California, five people in California, and only one of those people were a supervisor you had to train that training had to be two hours in duration and it had to be completed every two years there's a bunch of other small print but that's it in a nutshell well last year we had a new law passed in california that brought that threshold of companies required to provide this training down from 50 to 5 which really impacted a tremendous number more of companies within California. And not only does the training now have to be for supervisors, two hours of training every two years, but all employees now have to be trained. And those employees need to get, the non-supervisory employees need one hour of training every two years. So businesses were in a bit of a scramble, although they did have a bit more than a year to get ready for this, but apparently the... um, There was a lot of uh, communication to (laughs) Sacramento expressing concern about how difficult it was going to be for companies to comply with this. And the governor a couple months back passed an emergency piece of legislation or the governor signed the emergency piece of legislation and gave us all an extra year to comply. So that new training for companies of five or more that does include supervisors and non-supervisors has now been postponed till January 1st, 2021. Oh, okay. Okay. I would recommend that people not wait till November <laughs> <laughs> next year to do that, but there is a little bit more time. Paul's going to wait till next November. He's got to train just to take care of himself. <laughs> I don't know. We could train right now after we go off air. So, um, so that's the the legal part of it. Um, I don't want to put you on the spot. But no, do, you have, it's okay. do you have a good like um, sexual harassment case that you were involved with? I have so <laughs> many so of them. Many. <laughs> can you, can you pick a good one. Yeah, you, you know, probably the one that jumps to my mind was a a small medical practice, and it was a partnership of four doctors. All friends from medical school, and two of them happened to be a married couple, and allegations started coming in about the male counterpart and the married couple. And honestly, the partners somewhat brushed it under the rug for a while, a little bit because, well, he's our friend, and we don't want to make a big deal out of this. But then afterwards, more allegations came forward. The company ended up bringing my firm in. We had already been doing some other HR work for them, and the allegations were heinous. And I had to sit with the business, the other two business owners, and ask some very, very tough questions to this gentleman. And he insisted on having his wife in the room, so she had to sit through listening to me make these allegations. At the end of the day, she felt that he was just a misunderstood person. And she was kind of okay with some of the behavior that he demonstrated. 
But this rose to the level of the doctor ended up needing to be terminated from the practice. And because he was one of the business owners of the practice, it actually almost destroyed the firm. And we ended up bringing counsel in some of the employment attorneys that we work with, as well as a corporate business attorney. And they ended up managing a way to exit the husband and wife from the other two doctors who are successfully still in business today. But yeah. they kind of joke around that if it hadn't been for us, they'd be without their business and maybe in jail. <laughs> but wow. <laughs> it's so, tough. It can really impact people's lives. So I never thought about that. I get involved. Um, I'm sure you've probably heard of the term buy-sell agreements. Absolutely. So I wonder... I don't remember what component of a buy-sell agreement that would trigger, I guess, unlawful act? Well, in this case, they didn't have a buy-sell agreement in place. Mm-hmm. So that was part of the, oh, the pr- it was problem. Part of the problem. Yeah. yeah, they had to then, once they had this terrible situation at hand, start negotiating what the terms would be of the split up of the company. So yeah. good reason to have a buy-sell. Well, maybe not a reason alone, <laughs> but it's just one more example yeah. of why it's smart to have yeah. something like a buy-sell agreement in place up front. Okay. You just never know. Right. Yeah. I think so. A takeaway there is is regardless of how, I guess, good a friend you are with partners. I think you have to. There's the business aspect, and then there's the friendship aspect. And exactly. I think you got to move the friendship aspect to the side and make sure you have everything. Buy sell was one example, but sexual harassment training, everything in and, place. And people tend to think that just because someone's a business owner, or we've got another example right now where we're doing some coaching for a company where the general counsel is the one that's alleged to have been acting inappropriately. Oh my goodness. Just because you happen to be a business owner or another professional, even attorneys, people can do things, yeah. whether on purpose or inadvertently, that cross lines that get companies in tremendous amounts of trouble. Yeah. Yeah. So. Wow. Okay, good story. You're welcome. I've got 25 more. <laughs> well, if we have time, we'll circle back to another. But can't, I want to make can't sure. Can't mention any names. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> that's probably better that way. Um, all right. So marijuana. That this is new. Oh my. This is new territory. Pretty much, right? This is new territory. Yeah. Uh-huh. I mean, the issue of marijuana and its legality has been, you know, ongoing since the early 1900s, but with it impacting the workplace and employers trying to figure out what they do with regards to policies as to whether employees can be under the influence or not of marijuana and when can an employer test and when can't they, it's become a very, very complex topic. I've been um, speaking across the country on this. I've got an entire couple-hour presentation that goes into a tremendous amount of details that we don't have the time for today. But it's really become a challenging issue, Hmm. particularly in states such as California, where we first created the legality for medical marijuana use. That was already challenging enough for employers in certain circumstances. But now that it's been completely legalized for recreational use, it's it's a hard place to be as an employer. I know that you have a long presentation and it's complicated. Are there general guidelines we should know as business owners? So, yeah, let me share the, the general guidelines that we've all lived with for a very long time that Strangely enough, we can still rely upon in California. This is maybe one of my very few examples where California has a position that's a tad more employer-friendly than other states. Well, that's for now. For the record. <laughs> yeah, for the record. It, it probably won't stay that way. But for the most part, even when different states, and sometimes it's cities as well, have been passing laws that are making medical marijuana use permissible if people have the appropriate permits, and even recreational use, it still remains a violation of federal law to be in the possession of under the influence of marijuana. And so employers in California through today have and continue to still be able to take the position if you are, say, testing somebody pre-employment or testing somebody under reasonable suspicion or after an accident on the job, even though marijuana use in California is legalized, we still as employers can take the position that it's a violation of federal law. Therefore, an employer is free to terminate an employee or pass on, for example, hiring an applicant. That has gone to the California Supreme Court, who has ruled that even an employee or an applicant, say, with a medical marijuana card, does not impose a requirement for the employer to make an accommodation for that. We are still allowed to rely on federal law. That is changing 
tremendously rapidly across the country as we are seeing other states and cities pass laws saying, "Uh uh-uh, just because it's a violation of federal law, we still feel that the employer has to either provide a reasonable accommodation for the disability at hand. We're even starting to see Connecticut is kind of on the forefront here. We're starting to see prohibitions about testing for marijuana. From what I'm seeing out there in the landscape, I think we may end up with some federal legislation on the topic. And I am now at the point where I am worried enough about this that I am even advising our California clients to be very, very cautious and consider maybe not making a termination or a hiring decision based on marijuana usage. Really? Yeah. One of the challenges is that we don't yet in the medical industry have really good testing for marijuana. When we test, depending on the type of test that's used, we're only able to ascertain if somebody is used within, say, the last 30, 60, even sometimes 90 days. So you test an applicant or a current employee. They test positive given the current testing methodology. You don't know if they you know, ingested marijuana 20 minutes ago or mm. 20 days ago. Mm. Puts you in a yeah. Very difficult and awkward yeah. situation. That's evolving as well. There's saliva testing that's in the testing stages now itself that we may end up seeing become commercially viable sometime soon. But for right now, it's a really dicey area of the law. Add that to that we're in a really tight labor market right now and companies are tremendously mm-hmm. struggling to find talent. We're hearing from a lot of people that if they pre-screen for marijuana usage, which as I re- remind everyone is perfectly legal in the state of California, they just feel like it would be cutting down so into the applicant pool. The universe. Yeah, yeah making hiring even challenging, more That's, challenging. That sounds so gray and murky. It is quite murky, yeah. we. My presentation that I do is called the blurry haze of marijuana in the workplace, <laughs> okay? That'll uh, be another show. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, answer me this, Batman. Um <laughs> I, I prefer to be called Catwoman. Catwoman. But okay. All right, we'll go with that. So, obviously, alcohol is legal, but coming into work, you know, drunk is probably frowned upon. Pretty typically. And um, I, but I'm not sure. Is it usually in an employee handbook if you come in low stone? It is. Stone? Yeah, okay. Yeah, it usually is. Would the same sort of like someone has a medical marijuana license, they ingest it for their medical reason and they come in and I assume they could come in partially impaired um, depending on the amount. Do th- is that also a murky line? No, with alcohol testing it's a lot less murky because alcohol tests we have the ability to know how much alcohol is currently in the person's body and a fairly reasonable expectation of when it was consumed. Yeah. It's a lot less murky. But interesting that you should bring that up because in my presentation One of the points that I make as a takeaway for employers is that I am suggesting that people start treating marijuana in the workplace the way they treat alcohol. That was such an inflammatory statement (laughs) that when I was being interviewed for a newspaper piece that was being done, the editor made the interviewer call me up and say, did she really say that? (laughs) Because alcohol use is legal. And when people consume alcohol outside of the workplace – We tend as employers to not have a big problem, if a problem at all with that. What our problem would be is if somebody is under the influence and impaired while at work. Mm -hmm. And I think that as far as pre-employment testing or testing in scenarios that don't necessarily warrant you're having some kind of reasonable suspicion that somebody's under the influence of marijuana, I think we really need to start start shifting our mindset about it and thinking about it like we think about alcohol. Mm. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. That it seems logical. It there's, does. There's a state federal difference, yeah. obviously, yeah. and um, yeah, very interesting. And do you see that getting cleared up anytime soon? It's going to be an evolution, right? I think it's going to be an evolution, but I I would imagine that have me back two years from now. I think the landscape is going to be very different. different. I think the testing methodology will have advanced. Yeah. I think we may have federal laws, and I think we'll see potentially challenge to the California Supreme Court decision that told us that it's okay right now for us to rely on federal law. We'll see. Interesting. Okay. We'll see in two years. All right. Okay. I want to make sure we touch on the 1099, which is, I know, a huge subject in in a lot of industries, right? I mean, oh my goodness, across the board. It's got people in an uproar. So uh, independent contractor status has never been something that's been very easy to determine. And it's always been a source of confusion and liability for companies. Um, Frankly, I see 
I, I frequently see employers and the workers themselves saying, no, we like this independent contractor relationship. It works for us for a number of reasons. California and the federal government as well, but particularly California, have always frowned upon the use of independent contractors. The thought process behind it is that when someone's an independent contractor, while yes, they are free to make more decisions about how they provide their services, they aren't afforded things like minimum wage and workers' compensation coverage and unemployment coverage and you know protection for paid family leave, and, and the list goes on. So California, several years back, passed legislation that actually made the intentional misclassification of a worker a criminal act, which imposes fines of five to $25,000 per occurrence. So we've already been very serious in California about this. That's that goes, today? No, that is the law today. That law was passed mm, 2015-ish. It's been a while. Criminal? Criminal penalties. The... Where we've been, though, is that the criteria for determining if somebody's a worker versus an independent contractor have been, you, you said hazy, maybe murky is the one I'm going to use mm -hmm. for this one. There have been, like the IRS has its list of how you make the determination. The Workers' Compensation Appeals Board has theirs. The Labor Commissioner has theirs. Companies have routinely relied on the IRS's list that used to be called the 20-question list that got shortened down to 11 questions. But it's typically these multi-factor tests that take you to a list of questions. You answer yes or no, and that at the end, sometimes you're still scratching your head, is this person an independent contractor or not? So it hasn't been an easy determination. What's happened here recently is that in 2018, we had a very pivotal California Supreme Court decision that implemented what's called an ABC test. An ABC test is a three-prong truncated test that's on the rise across the U.S., and it's a, it's a very clear pass-or-fail kind of test. If you can't establish that the worker meets all three of the A, B, and C criteria, you have to treat that person as an employee. Funny anecdote is that up until now, Massachusetts had implemented this ABC test, and California didn't want to be outdone and decided they were going to align with it. So the Supreme Court hmm. put this ruling in place last year, and just several weeks ago, our legislature took that decision and codified it into the California Labor Code, creating a few exceptions here and there, but it's really put some serious teeth into California's rules regarding independent contractors. What's the takeaway for our listeners with regards to 1099? Be extremely careful. Um, safe to rely. If you rely on the, the ABC test, you are probably going to be very safe, even if you don't like the answer. And use independent contractors in extremely limited circumstances when it's work that's outside of the regular course of your business, when it's for a short duration, when you really exercise little control over that worker, and when the person that you're hiring truly is in business for themselves. That's the takeaway. It's extremely costly if you get this one wrong. Wow. That doesn't sound good. No. <clears throat> Do you, I mean, your world is constantly changing. Is it every year there's new oh different goodness. changes? Every year. I serve on a uh, committee for the California Small Business Association where we review pending legislation every year. And there are years where I have upwards of 100 bills that I have to review when they're in the drafting and approval stages. And it's not uncommon that in California alone we'll have 20 plus new laws every year that get passed that impact the employment arena. So you've got federal, and then you've got all the states that you're in, right? Federal and all the states, yeah. There are times where I put my head down on my desk and go, I don't want to do HR anymore because <laughs> it's gotten too complicated and too crazy. But then yeah. I pick my head back up and know that we help companies out there be less at risk and more yeah. successful, and I keep plodding along. And power on. Yeah. All right. That This time has flown by. My goodness. That was a fast half hour. Yeah. And I um, hope that you'll come back because I think I'd love to spend at least a half hour in each one of those because they're so timely and of interest. So if that works for you, let's do that. It would be fabulous. I'd love that. But one of the great things I get to do is I have the pleasure of asking my guests their final thought question, which is if you could share your ultimate lesson learned over your career as an HR specialist. My ultimate lesson learned. I'm wondering if I should be more philosophical or more cynical. <laughs> I, I think that the 
primary lesson that I've learned that I would want to share with people is don't make the assumption that because your business is small, you don't have to worry about employment law. And don't make the assumption that because you're doing something that makes logical business sense to you, that you won't be able to get in trouble. Mm -hmm. So second guess things, get expert help, rely on the resources that you have out there, because it's just gotten to be very, very challenging to be an employer, especially Mm -hmm. in this state. Was that your cynical or philosophical? That was my cynical one. (laughs) (laughs) Um, How can people reach you? They can reach me by our 800 number, which is 1-866-VHR-RELAX, or our website, which is VantagioHR.com. Can you spell that? Can I spell V as in Victor, A-N as in Nancy, T-A-G-G-I-O-H-R.com. And uh, remind us what vantaggio means in Italian. Vantaggio is an Italian word that means advantage, advantage. leverage, benefit. So if, a really funny side story. When um, Remember when Nicole and I were in Rome about 15 years ago, I took her for her 21st birthday, we saw Vantaggio Street. We took That's that picture not a for funny you. story. You took a picture of that, yeah. and I have uh, that picture enlarged and framed in every one of my offices bar. <laughs> So there we comes go. Comes back around. Thank sure you. Sure does. Well, Lorraine, thanks so much. This was really, really interesting. And, so fun. Um, can't wait to do it again. Told you, put the headsets on. You can't, can't get me to stop talking. That's right. You're like Paul. So, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I want to thank everyone uh, who has t- tuned in, and we look forward to being back in studio again next week. Cheers. Tune in next week for the latest edition of the Zanbergen Report, Tuesdays at 2 p.m. Catch up on our recent shows by visiting bartzanbergen.podbean.com. The Zanbergen Report is also available on iTunes, iHeartRadio, and Spotify. Interested in being a featured guest on our show or have a question you'd like to hear us answer? Email podcast at bartzanbergen.com. Bart A. Zanbergen, CFP, and Letitia Burbaum, AIF, are registered investment advisors with Optivist, Inc., and registered representatives with Gramercy Securities, Inc., member FINRA and SIPC. Investment advisory services are offered by Optivist, Inc., under SEC registration.